Hello and welcome to Dateline London. The unrest from Tunisia spreads to Egypt and Yemen. How serious are the problems facing Arab leaders? Plus, did the Palestinian leadership give away too much to Israel? My guests today are Henry Chu of the Los Angeles Times, Jonathan Sachidoti, who's a Middle East analyst, Abdul Bari Atwan of Al Quds Al Arabi, and Polly Toynbee of The Guardian. Very good to see you. Well, some Arab commentators suggested that the ousting of Tunisia's President Ben Ali would lead to convulsions throughout the Arab world similar to 1989 in Eastern Europe. With protests in Yemen, Jordan, Algeria, it is Egypt which has been the focus of most attention. Could we be about to witness the downfall of Hosni Mubarak? Oh, yes. Um, I believe it's a matter of days. Uh, Egyptian people wouldn't stop until he goes, exactly like what the Tunisian people did. So. Uh, I'm expecting more riots, the more actually um, heavy-handed from, from the regime or the remain of the Egyptian regime. But uh, the people in Egypt lost confidence in their leader. He tried to salvage something. He promised re reforms. But it's too late. He was there for 30 years. Why he did not introduce these kind of reforms? 40 million people in Egypt under the poverty line and also the suppression in its, in its peak now. So I think the best solution for Egypt for this man to go and to have a proper election and this election to have a proper leader. And, and, and this is the only way to quieten the streets and also to prevent more, more actually trouble. And it's interesting. It as in Tunisia, there's a lot of young people who are educated, mm. young Egyptians who are ambitious, mm. who want to do things and can get jobs. Yes. You know, unemployment in, in Egypt more than 25 percent and among young people is about 35 to 40 percent. Uh, people are really in, in a very, very frustration, uh, frustrated situation there. And what we notice, it is not actually the parties which belong to the Cold War who are leading this kind of demonstration, neither in Tunisia nor actually in Egypt. It is the young people. It is, it is you know, those very, very sophisticated, very educated and very ambitious young people. Most of people in the Western world and also in the Arab leaders, they ignored the young people. They never understood them. So that now they are paying a heavy price for ignoring those people. They did not introduce some sort of, you know, economic reforms which could create jobs for those people. It's interesting, it's the Twitter generation, the Facebook generation, uh, the email generation. The regime is kind of caught up with that in the sense of trying to stop those means of communication, but they can't really. Uh, even if they can, you know, it didn't need Twitter to start the French Revolution or most revolutions in history. Uh, we're not totally dependent on those things. I think by the time something is this big, it has a momentum of its own. But for us outside observers, it's, it's fascinating and unknowable to know where the tipping points are. We watched Tiananmen Square and wondered, was that going to be a tipping point? And it tipped the other way. Uh, it, it isn't always inevitable that the people win. Sometimes armies win. And so it seems to me that things are, are finely balanced. But it's incredibly moving when you watch people just come together and decide to take over their destiny. And if it all happens, of course, this will have been the best moment because afterwards there's always <laughs> complication, <laughs> disappointment, <laughs> disillusionment and difficulty. But the revolutionary moment itself is always a, a miraculous thing to watch. Jonathan? Well, it's, uh, that's absolutely right. It is obviously momentous stuff that we're watching now, but it's, uh, as well as incredibly moving, I think it's incredibly scary. And, you know, sitting here in London, it's very easy to watch these images on the TV. And uh, we feel for the people who are out on the streets doing that. It's hard to imagine what we would do in those situations. From an Israeli perspective, of course, it's, uh, it's obviously something they're keeping a very close eye on. While there's no immediate threat to Israel's security from any of this, of course, the entire neighborhood, let's say, is erupting in these popular revolutions. And and uh, what it's really showing Israel is that, in fact, uh, it's something that most Israelis already knew, which is that when the government of Israel makes deals with uh, its neighboring countries, those are deals that might only have a shelf life of, say, 30 years. So Israel um, is currently, or, or was very recently, until very recently, at peace with Egypt. But should the vacuum that's created be filled by a Muslim Brotherhood government, which is very possible, um, the whole thing is up for grabs again. And it's obviously a great fear to Israel. When Israel's uh, main bargaining chip in negotiations is land for peace, that old idea that still survives today. What Israel gets in return from its neighbors is uh, an end to aggression, an end to war. One of those can be taken back very easily. The other one can't. And so, of course, the Israeli population and the Israeli government are watching very closely to see what happens next. Do you, do you get the sense, uh, listening to Hillary Clinton this week and, and Barack Obama too, but Hillary Clinton in particular, talking about the human rights of the Egyptian people and so on, that there is a drawing back from President Mubarak. They haven't said it 
um, you know, in any kind of specific way. But do you, do you read the runes that way? I think if you look at the statement she's made from the beginning and then now just a couple of days ago, there is a recalibration going on. Even pre uh, President Obama's speeches uh, on the subject have been pulling back some. And other statements saying that there will be re-examination, for example, of, of the over $1 billion that the U.S. gives to Egypt. Um, that could very well be on the line. I think what's happening now in Washington is that they're discovering yet again that when you put all your political eggs in one basket, that really can come back and uh, bite you. And we've seen that whether it was in Pakistan with General Musharraf or others. And, and the military leader of Egypt has been in Washington purely coincidentally, no doubt, yeah. this week. I mean, I, they are the kingmakers, aren't they? The they are. They, oh. they're the, the senior military <coughs> commanders from Egypt were in Washington and hurriedly uh, went back home after, uh, after the uh, unrest broke out. You wonder what was whispered in their ears by the people in the Pentagon on the other side. And now I think the question is, what is going to happen on the streets with the army? You know, uh, surprisingly, for people who don't realize, uh, realize it, that the people actually were welcoming the army in many uh, places in because Cairo. they didn't like the police very exactly. much. Exactly. And, and, and the army has an exalted reputation in, in Egypt. Now it just remains to be seen what happens. Is it going to be Tiananmen Square or not? What, what do you make of that, Barry? Because an, <clears throat> one analysis of what happened in Tunisia was yeah. it was a popular uprising, yeah. but actually it was this kind of reshuffling of the deck. Ben Ali is out, yeah. but mostly the same people are still in charge in Tunisia. So it's not been a revolution, really. Yeah, it is a revolution. At least, you know, we have a regime change by peaceful means. You know, there are two kinds of regime changes. The American style of regime changes, which we witnessed in Iraq and Afghanistan. They used B-52, F-15, F-16. And the outcome, horrible. You know, about hundreds of thousands of people were killed. And also, the, you know, the West lost more than two trillion dollars until now and it could be escalating so and we have the other style of regime changes which is took place in Tunisia and also hoping to take place also in Egypt what's happening now okay maybe Tunisia they change faces some of the remnant of the old regime still there but you know they are leaving one by one and the army is dictating you know the future of this country that in the Middle East and also in the Muslim world, the only institution, national institutions, in the eyes of the people, is the military institutions. And that's has legitimacy in Egypt. I was talking to a lot of Egyptians exactly. yesterday who, who, who really did say that. Exactly. They say, we look, we're very proud of our army and we think they exactly. can play a big role. Because, here. you know, the army in Egypt you know, actually started the first revolution in 1952 when they get the, rid of the monarchy there. So the, the image of the army is, is very bright and very rosy in the eyes of the people. Well, the same thing in Tunisia. So all those Middle Eastern countries, they try actually to neutralize the regime to keep it away from from the rotten politics or the dictatorship and they consider it is is that salvage is, is the one who can save them from the old regime if from the, the army took over would would they would you trust them to be guardians of democracy and to usher in proper elections no, well, no we don't trust them but the problem is now the army role is changing it's like Turkey for example they are not um, managing to have a military coup every 10 years as they used to do now we have army which is trusted by the people for a certain limit, okay, we can let you uh, to be the guardian of, of our society, but it has to be a temporary one. It has to be a transitional period. After that, we must have election, we must have reforms, but you cannot stay in power like 1952 forever and rule us. This is, this is a taboo now in the Middle East, and it seems it is working. The army in Tunisia, for example, okay, they, they, they guard the revolutions, and they did not clash with the people, but in the end, they have their final saying, now the old regime people are actually disappearing when after one. The uh, only uh, one is uh, left is the Prime Minister and he said I will resign after, after the election. I noticed a, a statement from the Muslim Brotherhood who, who are obviously quite powerful in Egypt saying uh, that they are hoping for a peaceful transfer of power and it's been quite clear looking at the demonstrations and talking to them this is a, a, a nationalist outpouring rather than a religious outpouring. So uh, far. So far. But the yeah, trouble but is that, I mean, that, the, that the Muslim Brotherhood appear to be the most organized, uh, the only organized, and the question is whether this great uh, mass movement can very quickly organize itself into a coherent political movement with a political leadership and party that can stand in opposition to a religious party and there be fair elections between the, you know, the strong religious side and the secular side. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's not an Arab country, but in Iran we saw a, a revolution which became a religious revolution, but didn't start that way that's in 1979, exactly right. and that's a parallel which, uh, as you suggest, Israel would 
of course. I find very, very difficult to look I mean, at. if we look towards what happened in Iran, it's a very good example. And, you know, that's pre-Twitter and pre-Facebook. Uh, but it, it has similarities. It's a, it was a young person's secular uprising against the Shah. And then what happened was, was it over the course of a year, what stepped in was uh, an Islamist uh, system. Because and now, they were the only other power structure. That and, was part of and it. And the though, case now is that, you know, the, the uh, opposition to Mubarak is not uh, united and formalized in the way that we might think of a democratic uh, opposition in this country. So um, who is going to step into that position very easily? Potentially uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. And that is a giant problem, especially with the border with Gaza, for example. I mean, when we look at the Hamas regime in Gaza, which launches rockets into Israel, we have to remember that it is a local chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood. So these sorts of things mean that this could be very dangerous, even if it ends up in a democratic solution for the whole world, the whole Western world. Jonathan, right? I do disagree completely here. You know, the Egyptian regime, Tunisian regime, all of this managed to deceive the West by saying, saying the alternative for us, the alternative for the dictatorship is the Muslim Brotherhoods, the Islamists. This proved to be not true at all. In Tunisia, people who were demonstrating in the streets, it is a mixture, a cocktail of everybody. Uh, the middle class in particular, the Gucci ladies, you know, they were actually in front of this de uh, demonstration. In Egypt, the same. You cannot say Muslim Brotherhoods are, are guiding that. I'm not saying no, it's a given. No, I'm saying you know, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't use this uh, to frighten the West, you know, from supporting the revolutions of the people. People are suppressed in the Middle East. No, I, people, I they, really, they, they suffered for the last 30 years because of these oppressive so, regimes. Now, that, we I should give the, point, the people, I if we are looking for a long term okay. stability, we should encourage the choice of people. I'll come back to you in a second, Jonathan, but I just want to bring in Henry in that. I mean, that's, that's been the dilemma for Western governments for, 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 for decades. And we saw it again this week with listening to Hillary Clinton. They know that democracy in certain areas could produce Hamas, for example. If you give people Absolutely. a free vote, they may not vote for somebody who actually likes what the Washington administration is doing. And that's a huge problem, because what do you in the end want? Do you really want democracy, or do you want people who are compliant? And that's precisely why the American government up till now has pinned all its hopes on particular leaders that they think can keep this bogeyman at bay. Now, whether that actually is a real bogeyman or one that's actually been invented and inflated is, is, is hard to say. I mean, I think what's telling right now is that when we talk about who would take over, who would be the potential alternative to Mubarak, very few names are actually mentioned. There is a vacuum there, I think. I mean, Obarade is there, but I don't think he has a real popular following. So who can actually But he's known in the West, vacuum? isn't he? And sometimes right. Western countries and Western media delude themselves. He's an English-speaking right. guy that we've heard of. Yeah. He must be the new leader. There's yeah. no particular reason for that within Egypt, is there? That's right. And there's not the constituency there that we might think or wish that there mm -hmm. were. Now, again, when we come back to the army, the question now to me is, is it loyal to Mubarak or is it loyal to the people? And I don't know that that's actually very clear at the moment. We'll have to only be able to see that over the next coming days. W John. Uh, well, I, 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 I'm not saying that there is a definite shoe in here for the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, I think it's important to note that there could be a better outcome than that, and we all hope there will be. But I do think that it's also important to realize that even among the protesters in Egypt, I mean, if we look at recent surveys uh, in Egypt, for example, the, the Pew survey just last center, the Pew Research Center, 82% uh, want stoning for those committed adultery in Egypt. 77% would like to see whippings and hands cut off for robbery. The, it's, it's not the romantic notion that people here might have looking at this and saying this is a popular movement for democracy and therefore will be good. It's a high risk situation. <laughs> but Barry, can we, can we just widen it a little bit because I know you've been, your mm -hmm. newspaper has been very interested in what's been going on, uh, these documents released about the yeah. Palestinian yeah. negotiations with Israel, which is, uh, as we all know, Egypt may be the most important country in the Arab world, but the flashpoint issue yes. is still what happens to, to yeah. the Palestinians. How significant do you think those documents were? Because they made the Palestinian leaders sound very weak. You know, the Palestinian leader are weakened uh, twice. First, because of these documents, they revealed, they made a huge concessions to the Israeli, and the Israeli said, no, thank you very much, we need more. And second, they are undermined by the revolution in Tunisia and in Egypt. Now that, you know, Egypt is the peace broker in the Middle East. Egypt actually promote the negotiation, the peaceful, actually, negotiation with the Israelis. So the Palestinian will be, you know, cornered here. What I noticed through these uh, revelations that, you know, for example, Cyber Khat saying to uh, Netanyahu and saying to Olmat, we are giving you the biggest Urshalim in history. Actually, he conceded the Jewish quarter, the Armenian, or most of the Armenian quarter, and also a creative solutions to the Haram al-Sharif, al-Aqsa Mosque, saying, you know, a, a committee from Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, Jordan, uh, Israel, and the Palestinians to supervise this. 
But what the Israeli did, no. Now the Israeli are in trouble. Why they are in trouble? Because if they actually uh, uh, make some concessions and listen to the American, make some deals with the Palestinian, maybe President Mubarak will be still in power. Maybe Ben Ali will be still in power. You know, because people are, are really frustrated. Okay, Mubarak went for peace. Actually, exert pressure on the Palestinian. Encourage other Arabs to join the peace process. And the outcome, the Israeli all the time saying no. Even, even the American administration is disappointed by the analysis of the situation. Let me j j come back and do a second. But um, your paper said this week uh, on the front page, it did make the Palestinians look weak, but it also showed that when the Israeli government says we have had no partner for peace, they're wrong because... In fact, everything was on the table. Yes. In, in, in the short term, the Palestinian negotiators look very weak and they plainly don't have the support of most of their people. And it seems to give huge strength to Hamas, which is you know, alarming in this situation if, you, if for those who want peace. But I think as people step back and look at it, I think the real weakness is Israel. That Israel, can Israel possibly ever want peace? If they can be offered this much, I mean, far beyond what anybody, any commentators were uh, imagining they were being offered, and still say no, they're not serious about peace. And in the end, America, to support Israel, has to support an Israel that is serious about peace and proves it is. The ball is now, we're, when we're back to, to, to thinking about uh, peace negotiations, the ball is firm in the Israeli court and they have to respond to what they did to destroy those negotiations. Well, I think that the, what we've learned from these leaked documents that were so tendentiously packaged by the Guardian and Al Jazeera is, is not what's being put across over that side of the table. I think it's uh, not a surprise to most analysts what was being discussed around this negotiating table. I mean, there's been certainly in Israel for a long time among the population a sort of mantra that people will say, we all know what a final status a settlement will look like. What we've learned from these documents is that we actually don't really know that because while most on the Israeli left even meant by that we think there will be two states for two people. We think that Jewish populated Jerusalem will end up more or less in control of Israel and Arab populated Jerusalem will end up more or less in control of the Palestinians and the major settlement blocks will be uh, ceded to Israel with land swaps to make up for that. While that's what most people meant by that, what we've discovered from these leaked documents is in fact that the Arab negotiators and their great elasticity, as the Guardian would put it, is anything but. You know, uh, there are certain neighborhoods of, of dense Jewish population which most would have assumed would go towards the Israeli and it's not so generous of the Palestinians uh, to come up with the solution they have and say, you know, Male Adumim and Ariel are actually not to be under Israeli control. We're talking about neighborhoods with thousands and thousands of Jewish not people living in them. neighborhoods, settlements, not neighborhoods. They are you neighborhoods. Know, they, it, it is it occupied territories, occupied Jerusalem. So they are not neighborhoods, they are we, we can get caught up on, on, on the rest of it at all, and that's illegal, not the point. Illegal no, no, settlements. The po that's the no, point. Just didn't say not they it are is illegal settlements. It is against international law to build settlements and occupy This is settlements. exactly the sort of problem. This kind of rhetoric is why when you find Palestinian leaders who are willing to negotiate around a table, and we've seen it, the actual problem that we've learnt about from these leaked documents is that sort of attitude, well, which is to say, no negotiation, maximalist <laughs> position, <laughs> not neighbourhoods. Well, but it was never tried. The Palestinian people never got the chance to say, well, in exchange for peace, would you go this far? They might have done. Those leaders might have persuaded them if the Israelis had been behind uh, it. Henry, but the Israelis were the but ones But the who Guardians said no. come out as, as more Palestinian than the Palestinians uh, in condemning them for even well, negotiating. There's no about Palestinian this. leadership. There's a distinction, isn't there? But, uh, Henry, well, there haven't been these riots in, in, in Bethlehem and Nazareth that we've seen in Egypt. It seems that the Palestinian people, thank goodness, haven't risen up against these leaders who were willing to make very sensible uh, concessions and negotiations. This, we've had a glance into, well, exactly. a, into something which sensible. isn't finished, though. It's a glance exactly. into something which okay. isn't finished. I, I want to bring in Henry. Judge uh, it on uh, that. What will be the impact on American policy of all this? I mean, they've got a region potentially in turmoil. I began our discussion today by saying it could be 1989. Some people think it could be. Uh, a region in turmoil, leaders they're not sure if they're going to be around. Mubarak, what's going to happen in Syria? What's going to happen in Lebanon? The question of Hezbollah. Uh, and they've got one ally that they can rely on, which is Israel. Israel. So no matter what happens and however we dispute this, is, that, is anything really going to change? I don't think so in terms of the reliance on Israel. In, in fact, that may even increase at this point because that will because look like the only, yeah, the only stable place that they can look at. However, that doesn't mean that there's been a good relationship at all between the Obama administration and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel. And I think that that kind of standoff is going to remain. But they, the U.S. has been so uh, blinkered, I think, in, it, in its uh, Middle East policy that it, it doesn't, doesn't see any alternatives and see any other ways out. And so perhaps this might shake them up, but I actually have a feeling it may entrench well, them even further. But Barry, where do, you, where do you think this is going, going to go? I mean, do you see that there's a grand possibility that country after country in the Arab world 
as, as you know, reading your newspaper, watching TV, watching Al Jazeera, yeah. seeing what's happening, will become inflamed and there'll be instability all over the place. Oh, yes, because, you know, the common thing in the Arab world is uh, suppression, oppression and, uh, you know, lack of jobs and young, young frustrated people. So that's, that's the, it is, it, you know, the same thing happening in Syria. There is no unemployment. There is a suppressive regime. The same thing in Yemen. Now demonstration in all, all streets of Yemen, all cities. Demonstration also in, 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 in partly will in, in, in some, some part of Gaza, and even the West Bank. So, uh, it is it, in Jordan. We know tens of thousands of people were in the streets calling for the fall of, of, of the government, which actually imposing but a lot of monarchy. Uh, interestingly, not, uh, not the monarchy. They, 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 are, they were talking about the government exactly. specifically. They are talking about the government because you know it is some sort of a constitutional monarchy in Jordan, not actually like mm. like Egypt. It is a presidential regime. So these kind of demonstration. It, it, it must happen simply because people cannot continue like this. You know, the situation is so bad and the corruption in its peak. Even we witnessed a, a demonstration in Saudi Arabia, women and men for the first time demonstrating in Jeddah. Teacher in Saudi Arabia also demonstrated asking for jobs because said, you know, we are unemployed in, in, in the richest country. So th that's, that's the name of the game now. The whole region is about to be changed completely, and exactly like what happened in, in, in Eastern Bloc. You know, once it started, the dom domino effect actually will spread in the region. Dom domino it, effect? Well, it is interesting because if we look at Jordan as well, you know, people aren't criticizing the, the king necessarily directly, but that is in itself illegal. The king chooses who is then in power. And, um, you know, Jordan is a good example of another country like Egypt that has a, a peace agreement with Israel, however frosty that might be. It's much better than the uh, situation um, with other neighbors. And I think the fear on the Israeli side is exactly what I said earlier, which is that if you make a, a peace deal, especially one that involves giving away land, which involves compromising your security potentially from that, the reason you do it is to make a deal so that you have peace for both peoples and security. If that could be then taken back by a new regime who won't okay. stick to the deals made by those before them, there's a real problem for uh, Israel. Uh, Polly, there's, there's all kinds of problems for the British and other governments. You know, there's 30,000 British people uh, there because it's a great place to go to Egypt for a holiday at this time of year, so they've got to get them out, uh, presumably. But what to do in the long term and when to say to Mubarak, your time is up and, and move on? That's a very difficult matter of judgment. I thought Obama was playing it very well today. I thought it was extremely judicious what he said, uh, calling for freedom, for calling for a peaceful response uh, to, to peaceful demonstrators, uh, abhorring violence. Uh, I thought it was very measured. But it's awfully late now for the West to be measured when you look how long they've propped up these very corrupt regimes, I mean, because they are afraid of the, uh, 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 of, of the Iran situation spreading all over everywhere, and goodness knows, it is a possibility, and it's quite scary. But uh, the West's reputation, particularly Britain's in Egypt, Suez, not <laughs> terribly good. I don't think, I think a period of silence from us might be a good idea. Uh, very briefly, Barry, a period of silence from the West, because the Egyptians are getting on with it themselves. Whatever yes. they decide w w is, is what will happen. Because now, you know, people are, are people in the middle is suffering from uh, Western hypocrisy. All those, they are talking about democracy and supporting dictatorship in the same time, corrupt dictatorship. Now, I believe the interest of the West, because of this choice, is in danger. I believe, you know, the war against terrorism could be in Tata. The peace process be between the Israeli and Arabs could be finished. And also, you know, younger generation could take over, new regimes could take over. So the choice between the West to choose, either to choose the people or to still uh, support the old regimes, which is co corrupt and uh, dismantled. We'll leave it there. That's it for Dateline London for this week. I am sure we will return to the topic next week. We'll be back at the same time. Goodbye.